Hey everybody, I'm with the very great Wes Dooley. How are you, my friend? I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Nashville. It's a beautiful town, isn't it? It's where music happens. It is. It's where people still pick up instruments and play things, don't they? And they actually sit in the same room at the same time. Exactly. And get inspired by the fellow players and often audiences. We were at Roberts last night. Yep. We went to hear what friend told me was the best bar band in the world. Now down in Melbourne, size 12, large, or number 12, large, my friends of mine in Adelaide say that's the best band in the world for bar bands. But I'm going to have to do more of this because there's great amazing? music doing. It was great? Yeah. Fantastic. And of course we have people like Marty Stewart out on the road all the time using our mics on the back line. We have uh, people like Jack White using our mics, the uh, KU4s, five of them, whenever he goes out and does acoustic tours. This is the center of live music and the center of people going heart to heart with people out in the road. I use your mics. Well, I'm delighted. <laughs> That's my piano mic there. There it is. I have that on my mono piano. I use it every day. It just sits right in front of my piano. And I use it on vocals. Well, I used to hang out with Les Paul in the green room at the Iridium. Yep. And he told me that that mic was the first great music mic. Wonderful. That when it came out in 39 at the World's Fair, it got somewhat eclipsed by TV, which was the other thing RCA showed. But that the real treasure out of the 39 introduction was the 44B and the BX, because as the preamps, as the recorders and the loudspeakers got better, it always sounded more and more just like music. And I've heard people from scoring people at stages like Fox's Newman stage to people like Eddie Van Halen tell me, you know, your mic is the only mic at 5150 that sounds actually like what I hear in the room. So when he taught himself to record uh, Alex's drums, he used to keep himself occupied after Valerie left. And he said, I went through all the mics. I found a great place in the room, where I found various places I liked the sound, but none of the mics sounded like that until I got to the 44. And he'd bought that because a friend said it was the best cello mic in the world. Oh, wow. And, you know, there's various cellists to have used them. If you listen to the movies, we're heavy in the scoring area, so you'll hear our mics all over the place. Uh, yeah, we, I did a session the other day with Shirley Came Down and with Brent Fisher. Okay. I don't know if you knew about that. It was like about three weeks ago. Okay. It was over at NRG, and we used all your mics everywhere. Wow, I didn't, because it, late, years ago, NRG bought some chefs from me, which I consider great microphones. Sure. And, you know, really compact, and I use them on, like, LA Philharmonic stuff we did and such. But I had no idea NRG was using... You have to thank her, for her over there. She brought them all over. Uh, it's wonderful. Charlene and Sammy and all the yeah, crew. Yeah, you've got, you got a good team. I have a great team. Yeah, fantastic. We started with two of us fixing microphones. Yep. Back in 76, when the bean counters dumped the division and said, ah, 16 weeks, we can turn you off. No one really needs you guys anymore. We're a big company, you're not. And we're 12 people now. And that's a lot compared to the two. Yeah. And the time from 76 till 98, when we decided to go 100%, well, 95, after I got through cancer, I decided to go 100% with what Les told me was the greatest mic in the world, the first great music Wonderful. mic. So tell me, what was the transition? Because you were using, it's all NOS at first, is that correct? Well, I originally just started out with no knowledge at all. I, I was doing a folk music show, playing records, on a college station in Claremont, our east of LA. And I was just, talking to a guy, um, Tommy Macomb, with the Clancy Brothers. They was at the Troubadour, and like a lot of young guys, 20 years old, I didn't know what I was saying. 
I just said. I still don't know what I'm saying. Well, I said, how about staying late yeah. and uh, after hours and doing a radio set for me? And he said, yeah. And I went, great. You know, kind of like that. Yeah. Because I had never done such a fool thing. I had no idea how I was going to do it. Yeah. But now I have this opportunity. So I drive from the edge of Beverly Hills back to Claremont in my 53 Pontiac. And I ask if anybody's using the Ampex tape machine that night. They said, no. And I said, well, ignore me, but I'm going to find a roll of tape and see if it works. So, 10 and a half inch octal socket in a console. I had to take it all apart into the three parts to get into the car. And then when we went off the air at midnight, since no one was there to tell me not to, I took the announce mic. Now I had a mic and 15 feet of cable and reel of tape and a tape machine. I drove off at two o'clock. I put it on a little cocktail table right up by the stage because that fit 15 feet of cable. And I managed to put it all together, not put my finger in some place that would be disastrous. <laughs> and yeah, you made sound in the mic and you could put it and reproduce. And they knew what to do with one microphone. And just like the video we have up here of Marty Stewart using just one of our mics, with the fabulous superlatives for uh, you know their vocals, they knew what to do. All I had to do was hit record and get out of the way. As Wally Heider, who became my mentor years later what and invented remote recording as we know it today, he said, "Your job is to find a place they like to be, to put a mic somewhere suitable." get out of the way and record from the moment there was any musician in the room till there was none. Except, of course, if it doesn't sound good in the monitors, but I had no headphones, so I didn't know. <laughs> I couldn't find any headphones. <laughs> so, four o'clock in the morning, I get back to Claremont with my roll of tape, put the tape machine back in the console, put the microphone back up so at six o'clock they could go on the air again, and played the tape and went, wow, that sounds really good. Which is exactly like years later when I met him at the uh, Ice House recording. I took care of the sound system at the Ice House and recorded some stuff for my show. But he was there to do Jackie Sh to Shannon with three tracks on half inch, along with the chief engineer for United Western where he worked. And I helped load it, but I am 20, 21, and they're um, 50. And they went, wow, that was helpful. How about next week we're doing Johnny Rivers nice. at the Whiskey and Go-Go. Why don't you come help us there? Wow, what time do you need me? Oh, by the way, we'll pay you money. You're like, oh, I like this one. I like this a lot. <laughs> And so it was that moment, though, of playing the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Macon back, and I went, that sounds great. I wonder how you managed to do that again. Yeah. And You're like, did what? you get lucky? <laughs> yeah. Well, luck is the big deal. Yeah. Luck trumps skill. But right. skill helps being consistent. And as Wally told me and a bunch of other people, the secret to making great records? You find great musicians. Right. So that's why we're so lucky today that you know, we get to work with people or be used by people. We don't work with people, we supply stuff. The closest we get to it is like Jack White, I was hooked up with because he was using 4038 ribbons, which we had started importing in 84 and learned from the BBC guys how to do a truly thin ribbon. And Joe Ciccarelli, who I'd known from oh, back when I brought some stuff over to him at the Village Recorders when he was working with Frank Zappa, Joe called me and said, Wes, he is, they don't sound right. I said, yeah, after every project, 
with a 4038 right up on your guitar cabinet, you got to put a new ribbon in. It's just that way. And um, so he said he'd like it turned around real fast. And I said, well, that's an extra hundred dollars because it's four weeks turnaround. We'll put it next in line for a hundred dollars a month. Oh, well, can't you do something? Oh, well, my son is 15. He likes Jack. Send me an autograph picture to William. And I'll get some points with my kid. Yeah. Because I don't have any relationship to anything, you know. Yeah. I, but Jack White. Oh, so Jack and Meg were nice enough to sign a Polaroid in front of the Robert Johnson oh. uh, picture. I mean, yeah. Jack yeah. just has such a sense of art. Yeah. And so my son still has that. That's how I, I, Jack went on my radar. And now, uh, you know, when they call and say, oh, we're doing an acoustic tour, can we get five mics together? That's a scramble, but we do anything we can to make that sort of stuff happen because that's so fun. It's or to have Marty Stewart out on the road, not just the RF Rural Free Delivery TV, RFD TV series he did for a while where he bought an A440 after renting it at the guys at Blackbird have that. And then, as I said earlier, he realized, oh, the ones I'd heard were tired and not maintained at the Ryman for the Grand Old Opry. This one's fresh and maintained, and that's what all the guys were talking about, telling me these are great mics. And we started by being on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. So even we though that there's only 12 of us, we get to do stuff in a variety of formats because we've made designs to fit. You know, the original 44 is great, but it's so many different pieces. It's a huge amount of hand work. And friends of mine said, well, how about something for us married guys? And my daughter was going off to college and my wife's a school teacher. My son said, well, you had to marry a school teacher so you could do something in the arts. <laughs> and uh, so my part of it was I said, oh, give me inspiration, God. And I did in the silhouette of the 77, I put the 44 ribbon because I had to make my own parts to work on all these microphones in 76. So I had parts around. And in the 44, you know, after I survived cancer in 95, I said, okay, let's leave a physical legacy. I went 100% parts, which took three years. And then, but I'd had shop classes in junior high school. Thank you, God. <laughs> and then I made parts for the 77, so I took some of those parts and some of the 44 parts on my shop drafting classes. And, you know, I made something that was more practical to build now to use the Odeo MIM magnets that I could get response, not just out to 30K, because most people don't know that part of the secret of the 44 and the big ribbon is we go, I can tune them down below 20 hertz. They tune them to about 40, but you now you learn stuff by doing service works in 76. And you learn the tricks, people say, oh, well you want to use this? this these early mics sounded great this way, but this one here in the last year had 20 dB less hum sensitivity. And so just by doing a lot of service work, you learn a lot of stuff and people tell you what's the great parts and what's not so great. So when we offered the 44C, because the parts interchange, but some of them are early parts and some of them are late parts because I'm from Southern California where we do hot rods. So the idea is to make the coolest car we can. <laughs> and it might look like a 32 disc coupe, but it also might have an XKE Jaguar rear end with inboard disc brakes and a supercharged Chrysler Hemi. That's okay. That sounds good to me. And that's what the A440 is. That's everything we know okay. about doing the 44 all the way through. Some really, uh, just an amazing high ratio transformer and the phantom power buffer 
We spent five years with some Germans working on that transformer. We well, are a little patient. I, that's the kind word. I'm just a little bit slow. Takes me a long time to get things, but I'm a bit Irish stubborn. German stubborn too, you know. They can tell a German, but not much. <laughs> so, I've been real lucky. I've been doing this for over 50 years. I had the inspiration of recording a great Irish group and then getting to go to the Astro the Troubadour and the Ice House. And I wound up working on the sound systems, recording groups there for my radio show and uh, discovering that there was just a wide world of music. And then a friend of mine was doing the LA Philharmonic broadcast. I got to do second engineering work on that and get Wonderful. introduced to what my mom wanted me to because her reaction when I at 10 played someone who played Mozart and made me take two years of piano and sang Gilbert and Sullivan. I played Bakersfield Country and she went, that's white trash music and we're not <laughs> white trash. <laughs> and I knew I had discovered some sort of art because that's, you know, when you get that sort of reaction, yeah, we you love know rebellion. you got yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. Hey, so speaking of mics, what's this over here? I don't know what this is. Oh, that's our, every summer, we yeah. try to put together a package. Ah. Because summer's a slow season. People have other things to spend their money on. Vacations, I'm flying yes. up to Idaho on Saturday. Yeah. I'm meet up with my wife, sister, brother-in-law, yeah. niece, all that stuff. And so to compete with that, <laughs> every summer we build up about 100 kits and we put together a kit of things we think are really cool. Great. The first year we did it, we called it the Ribbon Mike Survival Kit. Nice. And so we did that year, we did the TRP, the first dedicated bespoke ribbon preamp that we did Great. with Fred Fussell. Because I tried to get people to make me a modern preamp that would be ideal for Revan Mike so they could yep. hear them how good they could be. And everybody said, no, no, you do retro stuff and it should go into a thousand ohm um, transformer coupled input and that way it'll sound right. I said, no, but it sounds better than that. As Les Paul told me, as the preamps the recorders and speakers got better. The microphone's never been the limit on the big ribbons. This is a mic we did for guitar amps and such so that you could get the mic really up close. That's why the swivel's 360 degrees, nice. goes back and forth, has a really compact shock mount. And uh, we did these mics. This is, you'll find on the back line for Leon Bridges on the back line for Marty Stewart and the fabulous superlatives. You just snuggle it up on a guitar amp. There's five of them, one for every room, over at Blackbird. Great. And they have stopped. They, when people come, they, they say, oh, you want to try a 4038? That's good. We'll put a 4038. Let's put our 92 next to it so you can hear that too. And people go, oh. 4038 is real good. That sounds better. So we used to routinely get 4038s in from Blackbird because every after every project, you'd worn the little one-inch ribbon out. Yeah. You worked hard and it sounds great. But as one friend said about when he was using the really short ribbons and the buyers on drums, he said, Wes, just before it blew up, it sounded the best it ever sounded. <laughs> I know that one. So we don't get 4038s in for, from, for service anymore. Because they're using these. Because they're using these. <laughs> and then we started doing with the big ribbon yep. for our 50th anniversary. Right. This We call this the Ribbon Mike Survival Kit that first year. And it included the uh, 84, the one I used to get my daughter through college at Princeton. <laughs> because... Sarah had been, my wife had been brought home from the hospital to Princeton. Yep. And so when our daughter got in there, she said, you said you'd help pay for this. And I was called out. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I went, okay, and I took the parts we had made to service the eight, the 77s, yep. and I realized I could make one short, I could put a full-size ribbon in, and so I did, as a married friend of mine said, you know, I want to ask my wife for permission to buy one of your mics, but I can't get the money. How about something for a thousand bucks? So we did this one and we built almost 5,000 of them. Oh, wow. And as the, one of the guys two years ago here at a panel called out, he was asked, well, is there a mic currently being made that you consider already a classic? And he went, oh, yeah, the AEA 84. Because it has the same ribbon, has the same 16 half hertz tuning, it has the same transformer as the 44 in the slender pill-shaped case. And it's a really amazing mic. We made it sound slightly different front and back instead of the same front and back um, because that was handy for s smaller studios. And yeah, you fall in love with them. Right, amazing. But we had some people who wanted something that wasn't a figure eight. So this was a five-year project to take the KU-3 Right. Like the 44, a really uh, great microphone, but most people, again, didn't know about them. Yep. They only built 600. They were the most expensive mic that RCA built, and it was for dialogue work on film stages. Oh, wow. 1947. Wow, and then seven. when the condenser mics came along and then the shotguns, that was much easier to work with. And it, it was articulate because these mics go out and then roll off smoothly. These go out to 40 kilohertz. This one and this one are really smooth out to 40 kilohertz. This one for George Massenberg and our friends who wanted more at 20, we made it so that it has some resonator puff shields that it's only five dB down at 20 kilohertz. And then it rolls more steeply out to 40. For the classical guys, who want the absolute minimum phase shift, we make minimalist mics like the Nuvo, which is phantom powered, and the Passive. You can see there's actually two. It's the Bloomline 90 degree right. stereo mic. Beautiful. And these mics, they just, when they start rolling, they just roll smoothly. They roll out to 40 kilohertz before they duck. Beautiful. And most people don't know that, you know, we, we build stuff that you can do 96 kilohertz uh, recording, sampling, and we're filling all the dark space because we actually get it. And that's why the attacks, the, the front end of all those waveforms are accurate because we have really good control of phase shift. Amazing. So over the years since... 98, we've gone from making just the original yep. to things that can be done in those traditions that are specifically handy, phantom powered, and this is our, you know, we dedicated this to the Clancy brothers and Tommy Make because we wanted a lost leader that would survive road. And that's why it's back line for people like Marty Stewart and for Bonnie Raitt. If you caught the Bonnie Raitt um, and James Taylor show here two nights ago at the uh, arena. I didn't get here until yesterday. Okay, well. Wednesday o night. Over, over the drums for Bonnie's drummer, pair of these. Beautiful. And on the guitar cabinets, a pair of these. Wow. And we, the, Kip, who does, is her front of house guy, he had started using our stereo mic, and I ran into him at a body rate concert. I like to go to live because I consider that the gold standard. Because somebody like Pensado could make me sound great by just sampling me and putting it together because he's a fine musician. Could I do that live? Not on your life. I'm a spoken word guy. I started radio. 
I'm not a musician. If I could have learned three power chords and been in front of girls, I would have done that. <laughs> so instead, I designed stuff and I became a technician. I took care of sound systems that I recorded live. And I got to meet Wally Hyder and I got to be introduced to Gold Star, all the guys, when I was 21 years old. That's incredible. And I'm real slow, but I've gradually learned stuff. I joined the AES when I was 21. I started going to the monthly meetings where people would answer ignorant questions. I and still they, have plenty of ignorant questions. Hey, I have a ton of ignorant questions because I didn't know the questions I would have asked those giants that I was hanging around with. People who invented things like time energy frequency measurement. People who did the first, we went to electrical recording that made all of this really important. That there's the reason that we have ribbon mics and microphones in general. They had pre previously been packing uh, carbon powder into the wax you cut from the acoustical recordings. And then they took that off and then they would plate it because the carbon powder was conductive. So you could plate to it. But of course it's granular. It's very, very fine granular when you're dealing with that sort of, it's like talcum powder. But it, when you started getting better reproduction, you could hear the difference between the recordings you have done electrically and not. Now, because if you actually played the wax recording back, you, you on electrical sounded better. So I happened to, before he died, uh, realize that one of the guys at my church where Sarah and I got married had been in charge of Western Electric's development from making quiet pressings for the first electrical recordings. John, Dr. John Frank, another Irish guy, <laughs> who had no problem saying, you didn't show up at sun last Sunday at church, <laughs> but did come to our wedding. <laughs> and so I, when I was AES chair of the LA section, where I started realizing that that's what you did was you provided a service. Sure. And that was what made your life better. I got him to come and invite a bunch of friends and we did three monthly meetings about the history of recording. So the last project he did was the 3D cutter head for Westrex, for RCA, so they could cut a stereo groove. And he went to get it patented and that's where he discovered there was this guy, Bloomline, in the 30s, who had patented all this for EMI when he was trying to do stereo for movies before we got all distracted with World War II. And so it was all patented, all these things that John Frayne, who was one of the giants. So I've just gotten to hang out with people by being of service with the Audio Engineering Society so that as I got to the point where in 95 I wanted to continue this mic, that in 76 I'd gone and hung out with the people who had lost their jobs and they gave us some of the tooling that was left over from the labs that had been shut down and just, yeah, take it away. It's, we're not doing that anymore. Wow. So we got, we started with tooling from 76 and working on the mics and in 84, I, our chief engineer was friends with these guys at Western Electric and at um, RCA, said, you know, they still make the BBC mics and we should bring them over. And then we should learn to service these things, but they're, instead of 1.8 microns, 80 millionths of an inch, they're six tenths of a micron, a third of that thickness. So we stretched ourselves a bunch of times, but over a period of years to learn more stuff that I was just incredibly lucky. I said, my son said I had to marry a school teacher. Well, her dad was a biblical archeologist and he took all the money he could make from teaching college. He took it every summer and went to the Holy Land, to Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and he dug stuff up. And I once told her that the thing that made our marriage go was that I was like her dad. And she said, no, he was so driven type A 
he, you know, he played for the New York Giants. In 43, he was drafted. He was the punter. He made the 45-yard wow. um, field goal that got them into the final game, and he was the backup quarterback. I married you because you're nothing like my dad. <laughs> I said, no, your dad did weird stuff that no one had any idea why anybody would want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I do weird stuff that nobody had any idea why anybody would want to do this, and that's what makes the marriage work. <laughs> and she said, in that narrow area, it does. <laughs> She's now our managing director, and the reason that we have actually been able to make enough of these, because I hired her years ago to be in charge of record production, and then she went off and did what she loves, which was teach French, because that's what her bachelor's and master's is in romance, literature, and language. And then we got her, when she went through cancer 10 years after I did, and I had luckily gone through that cancer and survived, so I could walk her through the whole thing, and I, you know, I could be a support person for her like she had been for me. Because that's where we really learn who we are. You know, who we love and how we can support it. What music we love and how we can support it. And so um, she came in in 08 after she had gotten through with her cancer treatment and started doing the shipping because she wanted a job that wasn't as high energy as middle school French, where you're on you know, for 45 minutes every hour. It's like being on stage at the sure. Star, where the uh, Beatles did continuous shows. She's now managing director. Wonderful. And she's as a wonderful teacher. Has been part of us being able to get the youngsters here. Nathan, our chief engineer, Charlene, and Sammy, who do all the outreach from the manuals to the marketing to the sales to the. Uh, social media, as well as ribbon mics, record stuff, have their own bands. Right. And um, we're just, you know, we're able to participate, it's really fun, and we've been able to make specialty mics, ones that don't take up much space on camera, and have phantom power, so that you can hear a big ribbon sound, but you can take it into a TV studio, or onto a large stage, and for our 50th anniversary, I did two microphones. Because we, a friend of mine that I'd met at Caltech, I didn't go to Caltech, I went to junior college to learn tech <laughs> stuff. But he was doing a doctorate in high energy theoretical particle physics. Really loved music. And we started a studio, and we started making things. That was 64. And 14, started the year I came out with my mic dedicated to the Classic Brothers and Tommy Nick. Because without them, I never would have just had that moment of, aha, uh -huh, I want to do this. How yeah. do I do that? So this mic has every bit of protection I can put on a big ribbon. The ribbon inside is the same as the 44, 16 and a half hertz tuning. So it's smooth response down below hearing that it has the ability to go out quite a bit, but it has that transformer we were for five years with the Germans on. So we have a really great sound of the 40 kilohertz response, but we have enough of a, a one to one 10 ratio so that we can just put a buffer amp on it and give you that transformer coupled sound that all our mics have, but really a lot of output and 95 ohm output impedance so you don't have the interaction with the preamps input impedance. Because when we started doing preamps, we had to, we, we wanted something you could hear just how good a ribbon could sound. Right. And I alluded to that earlier when I said that I tried to get people to make preamps for me and they all said no. Well, let's move on to that before we finish up. Let's finish, well, let's finish up on the preamps. Right. What we've done with preamps is I realized that what really made a um, ribbon mic, passing ribbon mics, 
the original 44s work well is to have a pretty high impedance load because they're an active device. You, they'll give you oodles of output, as uh, George Massenberg, who's pretty technical, said. Very, yes. Uh, that he had been using our 44s right up in the bell of a Scott trombone. Wow. And then he was working over at Blackbird, so he tried the A440. Now, the A440 is cheated towards having absolutely the most output sensitivity you can, which means that with phantom power, you eventually run out of voltage. You'll do 136 dB SPL, which is as hot as we've ever measured a Marshall stack at full tilt. So we know we can do most things okay, but inside the bell of a Scott trombone is probably around 150. Yeah. So we can clip it out. And he said, you know, that's okay, but I can clip it in that. I said, yes, that's why we make more than one microphone. Now, and you're technical enough that now that I've explained it, you won't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing about the A440 is we can use it on something with the dynamics like uh, Lord of the Rings. We, we, we were about 80% of the level compared of high output 44s, 80% of the level compared to the Deca tree with the three M50s was a pair of our 44s. Because John Kurlander had been told by Howard Shore that he wanted the sound of this to be a little different. That he, want, he had found a treasure chest and it had a score in it that hadn't been played for 5,000 years. And he wanted John to make it sound like that. And we had done for John some custom ones as opposed to the four stock 44s we had done. The first pair went to Sean Murphy, who does all of John Williams' work. And he liked it because we nailed the original sound, and he said it was the only reissue he ever heard that sounded like the original. Wonderful. That we had done all the stuff. And in John's case, he said, I'm not trying to match the original, I need more level. So we dropped the supercharger on the Chrysler Hemi. <laughs> and, you know, that gave him... Still with done. the XKA real end. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, when we did everything we know, we went to the 440. Yeah. But that was, you know, we learned stuff, so that was 10 years later. So for John, he knew, he put his preamps right by the microphones, scoring stage style, sure. so you can kind of get away with that. Yeah. And uh, the more he brought up these mics that were eight feet back from the conductor left and right, and eight, six feet high and aimed at strings left, strings right, the more Howard said, that's it, that's the sound. And he realized that Howard had heard these great recordings in mono with just a single 44, and he liked them because they were the first great recordings. And if you, if you use modern equipment with those mics, they just sound more and more like the music because Les Paul would tell them. So we were trying to get a preamp that would let you hear how much you could hear in the way of music with the 44 and any of these others. And everybody said, no, no, you're retro, that's a sound. I, I said, I lived through that period. This is all we could do. We want to do this. And yeah. I don't want to get into designing electronics. I did this years ago. Yeah. And there's other people way better and you're better. So no one would do it. And then I would be visiting with Fred Fussell up in northern Idaho, and he builds beautiful stuff. He was Jackson Brown's guy, who did the studios, live sound when there was just one guy who was in charge of making it all sound good. And he said, I could design you an IC one. I don't, you would have to make it. I don't want to be in that business. And he designed this one. He designed the TRP. We've been building that since 05. Took a few years before we went through it all. But it, uh, it's no phantom power. It's just two channels with 84 dB of gain possible. And when we go for a lot of gain, a lot of stuff, when you run it wide open on gain, it starts sounding strained. But we wanted something that was like the mics. Our mics can go way down in subwoofer territory and they just sound easy and relaxed. They never sound like you're pushing. They can go out in the top end, out to 40K with the, uh, really smoothly, as I was mentioning earlier with the 
88 stereo blue line mic, back to blue line, who just was astonishing. And the NA, which is our minimalist, as little protection as we can put on it. The silver, the yin and the yang, the silver and the black in the Nuvos. The silver one is as protected as we can make it. It's designed for road work. It's designed to have one mic and that designed with three levels of pop screen. If you add the WinTech windscreen for it, you can be right here talking to it. You can put it in front of the kick drums, uh, front skin hull, and you don't hear with 18 inch subs any of the wind. It was everything we could do to protect it and still sound like a big rip. And the other one was the other end. It was as exposed as we could make a big ribbon. Minimalist. Without sacrificing survivability. You have to pay attention to the fact it's a really nice tool. But we've had people use them outdoors as, uh, at the Ojai Festival with the windscreens because that windscreen fits either. And uh, they can do the classical stuff, and then we have people use them on rock and roll stages. Great. And that's the end of the yang of that. This room was designed before we did the Phantom Powers. Yep. So it's lots of gain. We managed to snag some uh, wonderful trans JFET transistors. Yep. Uh, well, JFETs, I guess, rather than transistors. But, uh, that you can't get anymore. You know, we bought 20,000 of them. Oh, and, uh, that's good. <laughs> so probably next year we'll do a redesign of this because the front end's gonna change a little so bit. Is this, so is this borrowed from that? Uh, yeah, what we did was we did this. Yeah. And people like, um, well, Sean Murphy bought four of them, made up a package. Great. We had people um, in, Europe say, oh, I've listened to everything, and the ribbons never sounded this good before. Wonderful. So we did that, and then when we did the A440, people said, well, could you do something that uh, had phantom power? Whereas here, we deliberately didn't do phantom power, it's DC company. We just, it's, it's an audiophile piece. Yeah, with a, a lane lump on it so we could keep the hum away and keep the cost down. Because we didn't want audio file prices, we wanted that sound. And um, so that was the first, as I say, the first of our survival kits. This is this year's survival kit with right. the uh, pair, one or two of the 92s. This one, uh, in the first version, and I made it really ugly. I've done this one. I've done a gray one before in 85, all Jensen Transformers. That people said, it's really nice, Wes, but no, no one will ever pay $1,500 for two channels of my brand. Right. And, uh, but we worked out one that had bespoke EQ. Because... So tell me about the yeah. EQ here. Well, the EQ is a big deal. Some of the people who buy the stuff say, oh, we just bought like the 500 series because the EQ is really good and it gives us a really clean, transparent musical preamp as well. Great. <laughs> but what we did here was with the original RPQ, we did the things we needed for EQ and no more. Because a ribbon mic goes out really flat. Now we're going down below 20, we go out, and somewhere up around, depending on the design, 8, 10 kilohertz, we start rolling a little bit. And that goes on a long way. So the for those who want more high-end, but don't want the sort of condenser mic sound, because a condenser mic is a high-tune system. We're a low-tune system. All the resonance is down at 16 and a half hertz. The high tune systems, like a drum head, they're pulled tight. That's a condenser mic. They also need even naturally want to be an omni and we want to be figure eights. And when you make them something else, they you're pushing them some. 
So you take something like a dual diaphragm uh, microphone, like the 47s, the 414s, they work really, really well for tape. Because in the 8 to 12 kilohertz, to get that multi-pattern, you had to relax the diaphragm. So that in 8 to 12 kilohertz range, you had some very high Q resonances. And that's the tins. You know, and then we would do recordings of Hyders and Gold Star. And off the board, it didn't sound good. It sounded harsh. But by the time you went to tape, cut a disc, and put it up on AM radio, it just sounded airy because it all got smoothed off by this very fine sandpaper. And um, when you start doing digital, if you don't like the first copy, the fifth copy doesn't sound better. No. <laughs> so that's where ribbons started coming back in. And we had been doing it for some time for the people like Sean Murphy and such who, who got it. Right. And didn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. So, we just happened to be doing this, and I went through cancer treatment about the time where digital was really coming on. We've been selling a fair number of 4038s, but they have their, as a one inch ribbon, they have some limitations. And so, when we got to this one, we decided okay, if it rolls off like this, you yeah. need an EQ that has two controls. One of them says, what angle do you want this up? Yeah. Because you're trying to deal with an angle down, now you want an angle up. Yeah. And the other is, what frequency do you want that to start happening? Where's the knee? So, since I'm a big fan of not using EQ at all, unless it's better, we do a instant compare switch. And in this case, we added an LED to tell you whether you're using the EQ or not. Right. That was one of the things the, the RPQ2 has a LED on every button. Right. So you know what the status of everything is. And what you do is you uh, just can push it in and you can listen to see whether what you chose to do is just different or better. <laughs> because Wally Heider taught me that if it's just different, don't use it. The DQ yeah. is an incredibly easy way to get yourself into a place that you won't like later. Yeah. That if you can, you do it all by moving the mic and changing the mic. And you only touch EQ as a last resort. And in that tradition, we put an EQ in, it was really hard to mess up. And so we give you this one control, you want more highs, now, when we loaned the first one, or the first pair of these, to uh, Sean Murphy, he used them over at Warner Brothers Scoring. And we had told him it was designed to work everything well. So he came back and said, you know, I put it up on the three M150 Neumanns on the deck of tree, and it's a really nice preamp. Used it for three days. And the EQ here is really nice for condenser mics that are back aways to bring that, you know, take care of the air loss and to get a little bit more high when you have a really smooth uh, condenser mic like the M150s. Whereas for ones that have the tight stretch diaphragms like the 47s, uh, but you now do multi pattern, you, you bump up the high end and you quickly go from, oh, it has personality to, oh, that person's obnoxious. <laughs> and that's why you, if you happen to have a, especially with women singers, but you hit a sibilance, that's a very, if you look at a spectrum analyzer, that's, that's a location. Right. And so if the high Q resonance turns out to be that point, that's why you sometimes just go, oh, let's change microphones rather than making our life miserable in post. So the other thing about ribbons, they're native and naturally a figure eight. That means they're the king of proximity effect because it's the figure eight component that makes the proximity effect noticeable. It's, that's what does it. If you have a cardioid mic like an SM58, it's an amazing microphone and a wonderful price point, that's a figure eight, theoretically, when you analyze it, it's a figure eight 
with an Omni component. You mix them half and half, and now the rear end is uh, the, re the rejection point, and the front is twice as big. Okay, you can tell that because if you go in the front or the back with an SM58, you get base boost. If you go in from the side, which would be the null for the figure eight, but the plus one point for the Omni, you can go in right to the side of an SM58, and there's no bass boost. So if you're having a vocalist who has problems with the, the extra bass, and you don't have EQ, like we have here, the low frequency is just a smooth roll off, limited to 20 dB, it's a 6 dB per octave with a 20 dB shelf, because I like bass, I just don't want too much of it. So you try to preserve the bass, but make it t tamer. And you can do that if you have to with an SM58, just by having the vocalist rotate it and sing in from the side. Now if you don't have EQ handy, but you want to get rid of the fact that bass gets in the ray of the articulation above it, that's one of the tricks you can do. So this mic EQ, Yep. does that trick so that if you have the EQ you because with a true figure eight you run it off axis and it still has the bass the cool thing about all the big, big rivets we do is they have bass all the way down and they hold pattern all the way down so you can be off axis it sounds the same as on axis beautiful so this is the bespoke EQ that's the in and out instant compares the other thing is that... Uh, DI. Yeah. We had done phantom power. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you turn the phantom power off, and now it's a high impedance input. Because we have always said you, you want ribbons to get as high impedance as possible. It's the low impedance of the ribbon itself that sets the noise floor. And, of course, if you don't plug anything in, don't terminate it, and you turn it up, it's going to be noisy because the input impedance is a noise source. As soon as you plug a mic in, the mic becomes the limitation for the noise source. So we made the input impedance without Phantom 66K on this. This one we had made 18, which technically was the, uh, what it needed to be 10 times the impedance of uh, resonance at 50 hertz for an RCA 77DX. And if you have a 1K input impedance, now you have about a 5 dB. Oh, that's filter. interesting. So if you engage that, it changes the impedance. Yeah, because oh. it goes down to 10K if you use phantom power. And 10K, we consider an OK impedance for most everything. It works well. And we actually like to keep our impedances up, among other reasons, because when you do splits, like in a big, for either for things like you're doing if there's a big news crew or in a something like an arena, you often have splits going. The mic goes multiple ways. Now you're putting in parallel multiple loads. So since I would had people say, oh, I can't use that unit on, this, on our system because it makes the mic sound not as good. Right. Yeah, you have three 2K and you're down to 666, that starts to really make some mics sound not so good. And phantom powered mics, it can sometimes, it's need, it needs a fair amount of current. And if you do three 1K, you know, your traditional impedance for a transformer couple, like the guys were trying to tell me I had to have to go with my retro mics. And I went, no, no, I designed these things. I knew the guys who designed the other stuff. We did the best we could with what we had then. We're trying to do the best we can with what we got now. And after we did this one, people like True, Grace, they all borrowed our stuff. And I asked the guy at True why he wouldn't you know, just make what I asked for. And he said, oh, I had no idea you'd sell any. <laughs> so, you know, we're a small company. We right. know. 
that as soon as we start selling anything, other people do it. You know, we've been doing it for a very long time. So that's, that's, a, lot higher, that's a lot higher impedance than I realized, because it was always traditional and Neve was uh, 300, 1200. That's because, as someone once said to me, Rupert was a transformer designer, yeah. and that's right. part of why he was doing the Neve stuff was to sell more transformers. Right. You got a factory that makes transformers, and you know how to design the transformers and the electronics well, you build constants, and they're great. But that's what you know, and that's what you do really well. And I was just lucky that Fred is one of those gifted people that we didn't even get into the, he did this bespoke. Who um, designed this one? These are all Fred for sale. Oh, okay. We, I have a deal with Fred. He designs right. stuff, I don't fuck with it. <laughs> or let's I can reach it then. I have a deal with Fred. He designs stuff. I don't change it. Right. I can suggest things. And sometimes, like I found a heat sink that did a better job than a one that cost twice the money. He said, oh, that was good research. But I make high-end stuff, and it looks more audiophile than what I use. Right. But for years, no one goes inside it or sees it. That was a good choice. Wonderful. And in this case, when we went to the very high input impedance, now you can use all the microphones that are high impedance that were designed to go into the guitar caps. You just plug it in and just not turn the phantom on, and now you have an appropriate impedance. We made this by doing that and then by adding the 5 mega ohm input impedance on the front. We made it that if it was ever any intention of having audio out of a transducer, you could plug it somewhere here and get really clean musical sound. Wonderful. And this was a design he did for Jackson Brown Studio over in Santa Monica, Groove Masters. So for the last 40 years, 30 years, people have been plugging, not more like 30 years on that because he's younger than I am. Um, People have been plugging into the DI at uh, Groove Masters on Colorado Boulevard there and saying, oh, this sounds good. Okay. And so we're, as one of my mentors, who I actually copied his specific um, Revan mic when I decided to take a mic apart, use my junior high school drafting things, my learning to be polite to people who actually knew stuff, you know, and go talk to machinists and make more parts. Um, the guy who had originally owned the mic that I copied had died of the same cancer I had. And that Sorry. was uh, the guy that the uh, main lectures at the AES Richard Heiser lectures are named after. And Richard had had that, when he developed time energy frequency measurement, he used this to get, do polar plots in his living room. Which of course we use the same technology because we can't afford huge spaces. We got 2,500 feet, three blocks from my house. We do what we can with what we got where we are. We stand on the shoulder of giants and you can just be midgets. And Sorry guys, I'm clutching farther. my ears because some feedback going on over there. <laughs> was that you? No, that was something over that there. That was somebody over there. Yeah. So, that was, that mic had then gone to the guy who did the Porta Studio, the 80-8. Smile. And <laughs> who did the Model 5 console for Tascam. Yeah. That, and a wonderful guitarist, uh, name of Dick Rosmini. Now, Dick was a dying of ALS the same time I was in cancer treatment. I'd go to my cancer treatment uh, every day and then I'd stop by his house and visit. And I arranged to buy his 44 from him. I left it with him until he died. Now, I didn't know if I had time and I was really sad about losing Richard. His dad was an artist, so he's raised in the ghetto in New York. And he realized to get out of it, he needed to be really good at stuff. So what he did was he became one of the best guitar players, 
number of people said the best guitar player, you know, in 54, 56, in Washington Square. Moderately competitive, like Nashville. Yeah. If, you know, like uh, Cousin Kenny and the fabulous superlatives, he sometimes mentions the best. And as he said, well, it's nice to be mentioned, just like we're sometimes mentioned the best. No one's the best. It's just how good are you tonight? How inspired are exactly. you? And then you inspire other people and they try to be better than that. That's how the, work, the world works. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up and say thank you. You know what, this, is, this has been fantastic. We touched on so much stuff here. I really yeah. love it. And talking about Dick Rosmini, yeah. he was the one who told me that this was the best guitar mic in the world. Okay. That he had been, when he was 16, a friend said, need another guitar, we're going over to yep. Columbia. And they put a large diaphragm condenser up in front of him, and he went, this sounds so wrong. This, this doesn't sound anything like what's in my lap. Wow. And that's where he started, like I recorded the Clancy Brothers, he heard himself back and said, I got to learn how this works. It's got to be better than this. And that's how he wound up developing the whole project studio thing. Well, there's a will, there's a way. And yeah. he said that microphone on his guitar sounded like his guitar. Beautiful. Which is the same that... Well, this, I, I have one of these and I use it every single day of my life. It's all you need. As Les Paul told me at the Iridium in the green room, it was the first great music mic. As everything else got better, it only sounded more like the music. If that's all you have in the world, that's all you need. He owned five of them. I bought one of them for our museum in Pasadena at the auction for the foundation. And he told me one time a producer came over and I bought the rattiest one. <laughs> it, it was like inside, there's no girl cloth anymore. And they had pulled over probably one of uh, Mary Ford's stockings over the guts. And, oh, it works fine. Put it back in service. And uh, the producer said, oh, you had to scrape the bottom of the barrel. Right. And Les said, no, these are some of the best mics in the world. Right. And the next time the producer came over, he had borrowed 15 more. And what he had out were 20 44s and nothing right. else. And the only person who commented during the session was one of the violinists you know, was playing a really nice violin, and there was a starbird with one of these, and she said, what if it falls? And he said, actually, that's the same stand and microphone that Itzhak Perlman uses. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Good enough for we, me, we've yeah. been used by Itzhak Perlman Thars, yeah. so we're real happy about that we match up to his standards. And... At the end of the session, the producer finally went, I see what you mean. It sounds really great. So that's what we do. We try to make people sound you really do? great. Like I say, I have one. I use it every day. It's beautiful. Thank Warren, you ever so much. It's so much. much fun to have somebody who actually has the personal experience because you're an excellent interviewer. But oh, what's you? really fun is that you know why I would do such a crazy ass thing like this like my father-in-law went out and dug up pottery shards in Caesarea. Now this is, speaks to my soul and heart, and it's so much fun to be here in Nashville where people get it. It is beautiful, we're very blessed. Thank you ever so much. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. I might even ask where some questions. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is Wes Dooley saying from Pasadena, California, Nashville, via con Dios.